All right, so welcome back to the conference. Now um, we are reaching to the uh, final session, panel five on constitutional consequences. Um, we also have um, uh, three papers um, with uh, three very uh, distinguished uh, speakers and that one is cousin. Um, the first speaker is uh, Professor Chen Jie from uh, the Faculty of Law. Uh, Jie is a, a veteran observer of Hong Kong's constitutional uh, development, um, has um, written uh, lots of work on, on, on Hong Kong's judiciary and the constitutional law. So welcome back, uh, Jie. The uh, second speaker is uh, our professor, uh, Ko Jin Yat, uh, who was the passionate speaker in the first panel. So uh, uh, we have introduced uh, Ko Jin already yesterday. He uh, is um, our professor uh, at this faculty research on uh, constitutional law uh, and public law in, ge in general. Um, the third speaker doesn't require any introduction, uh, Professor Johannes Chan, our chair in public law, um, uh, our former dean, and um, uh, well known uh, in Hong Kong for his scholarship and uh, advocacy um, on the constitutional and public law front. Um, our discussion is. Uh, Professor Cora Chen, who is our, um, I said this before, our rising star uh, on, on public law, and uh, has a fun international re reputation uh, on her uh, scholarship. So each speaker would have um, uh, 20 minutes, and um, hopefully we'll have a uh, good discussion as we had in the previous uh, panels. So without further ado, Jia, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Professor Fu, for your very nice introduction. It's my pleasure and honor to attend a discussion that is of great importance for Hong Kong, China, and beyond. Uh, as you have just uh, mentioned, I'm a long-term student for Hong Kong basic law. And uh, for a long time, we have uh, take Hong Kong as the you know, future role model for China's uh, constitutional review and constitutional development. Um, um, almost a year ago, we discussed uh, some big picture questions, such as what is the most uh, probable scenario in Hong Kong? Um, more precisely, uh, what does the post uh, uh, national security law Hong Kong look like? How will the enactment affect individual rights? How will the law affect the rule of law um, in Hong Kong? Um, and also how will the law affect Hong Kong's economic uh, development? Um, today we still don't have you know, um, a, a full and good um, answers to these questions. In this paper, I provide an analysis from the positive perspective as a starter for further discussion. So I um, tentatively group existing discussions into three big categories. Discussion from natural law perspective, discussion from doctrinal or formalistic perspective, and discussion from uh, political perspective. Um, Studies from natural law perspective assesses um, ramifications to human rights and rule of law. Doctrinal studies try to figure out uh, how uh, the NSL uh, should be or is enforced uh, um, in the jurisdiction and also what are the major principles and rules uh, we should follow. And then uh, from the political perspective, uh, it, it has been the major defense for uh, the national uh, security law from the perspective of China's sovereignty interest and also central government's authority. 
Um, although these um, perspectives are important, there are also uh, some uh, paradoxes in these analysis. Um, to begin with, um, the natural law perspective um, tend to presume um, some values, um, and but values uh, can be subjective. And also um, because the national security law is a national law, so there's also uh, you know, it, it's also debatable whether these presumed values uh, are shared values or whether or not there are some other values we should prioritize. For example, a typical concern is how to strike the balance between national security interests and other uh, freedom of speech interests and also uh, dual process uh, interests. Um, on the other hand, there are some, um, you know, uh, extreme and uh, emphasis on um, political um, uh, concerns of, uh, you know, uh, of, for example, uh, whether or not the, the courts in Hong Kong should be um, more politically um, uh, affinity to uh, the central government instead of um, like the opposition um, clamp. Uh, or you know, from the perspective of um, doctrinal uh, arguments or um, formalistic arguments, there's a presumption of uh, the course being uh, neutral or non-political. On the other hand, um, I, you know, I, I, I believe that there are some benefits of um, studying national security law from the perspective of um, positive law in, in, in the sense that uh, it, pro it provides a more balanced interest concerns. Uh, and this is particularly in uh, important because China tend to view law as more instrumental. Um, it tend to put more focus on government and governance instead of uh, human rights. Um, well, it's always debatable whether you know that's a better or it's a inferior uh, perspective. But at least uh, in terms of a more balancing view uh, and in terms of taking law as a process of discourse and taking, um, you know, in, in the sense of uh, our academic uh, debates should also strike the balance between different perspectives. Um, another benefit of um, uh, a, a positive view is that it does not uh, presume uh, uh, courts as uh, non-political. Instead, it, it kind of see a, a more like courts as apolitical or political aversive, uh, aversive or uh, you know even uh, political sensitive. Um, so that that's kind of the the starting point of um, my um, perspectives and um, and, and my uh, approaches to this paper. I will start from the national security laws impacts on courts constitutional jurisdiction, because uh, this is probably the most important feature of the new constitutional order uh, after 1997 as identified by Professor Yashigai and many other constitutional lawyers. Before the national security law, the central people's government may return and uh, invalidate the legislature um, and um, you know, interpret the basic law. Uh, in the meanwhile, Hong Kong courts can also strike down a local ordinance and interpret the basic law. It is arguable if Hong Kong courts have the power or uh, what is the scope of the checking power in terms of national law. Um, so this is an open question before the national security law. Um, although the court um, in previous cases, like uh, the Congo Republic case and also the Trump Fong Yuan case, um, did review some national um, uh, people's uh, Congress standing committee decision and you know, more or less um, you know, re review the national uh, decisions. Um, however, this kind of uh, dual track uh, interpretation system also creates tension between the two uh, interpretary uh, powers, especially between the National People's Congress and the Court of Final Appeals. Um, so 
this is the um, a diagram that I, I think may you know dis describe uh, what are the um, previous constitutional order before the national security law was enacted. So on the one hand, you know th there's this um, um, sort of checks and balances between the LACO and the chief executive of the government. On the other hand, there's an independent uh, court system uh, which can uh, supervise both branches of government. And at the same time, you know, there's no um, paralleling or uh, symmetric uh, national uh, court to respond to the decision of the Court of Final Appeal, which creates sort of tension between the National People's Congress and the uh, Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal as the, the two major interpreters of the basic law or the, the constitutional order of Hong Kong. Um, the national security law um, limits the constitutional jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts from three aspects. First of all, it limits um, the court's uh, capacity to interpret uh, the, the, the enactment. Uh, second, it uh, limits its uh, capacity to review um, some of the uh, national security cases. And finally, it um, restricts um, judicial appointment. It's kind of a, almost like a repacking of uh, a court of the panels that could adjudicate these uh, kind of cases. As a result, courts um, pronounced that, um, you know, it's not the court's jurisdiction to review constitutionality of the national uh, security law, which is kind of a, uh, different narrative compared with the the the, the post nineteen ninety seven um, uh, declaration that courts do have power or 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 less proactive but also kind of a practice that court used to um, review national decisions or other national um, uh, uh, documents without uh, expressly. Uh, proclaiming that uh, the courts has uh, the courts have or have not the judicial review power over national legislations. Um, so the, the next, um, I examine the national security laws impacts on Hong Kong's political development. Again, before the national security law, uh, Hong Kong has a checks and balances um, system evolved from the executive led government government during the colonial rule with a legislature represented by both direct election and functional um, electorates. So I emphasize here that it, it evolves from a um, ex executive led government. It, it's arguable whether the, the basic law has the has designed or has the design of a uh, executive led government, um, but judging from many of the uh, speeches both from the central government and also the original um, drafters of the basic law, there seems to be an intention to you know, really emphasize the, the, the power of the executive, both as a, like a consistency of the previous system and as a kind of a, um, the, the Chinese understanding of how Hong Kong was able to be successful under the colonial rule. Um, but over time, this kind of structure has evolved into a more checks and balances system. Um, however, this um, national security law changed the um, political dynamics by introducing new institutions to empower the executive um, and also to kind of, um, if not to weaken, but at least to um, make the political opposition in Hong Kong more vulnerable or um, uh, you know, less likely to be elected uh, as a electoral member of a, or a uh, public officer or uh, office holder. Um, there are you know, many of our uh, participants and speakers have addressed of these uh, clauses. Um, among other things, I'd like to highlight, for example, uh, Article 35, which uh, expressly uh, prohibits uh, offenders of the national security law to 
would be um, public office uh, holders. And, and of course, there are also indirect um, impact on the um, uh, legislature um, in the sense that uh, some of the political organizations um, have disband immediately after the law was enacted. So this kind of chilling effects and also the speech crimes um, pro provided by the law uh, will have um, impact on uh, the um, composition and organization uh, of the legislature. And um, next, um, I want to compare the relationship between the Central People's Government and Hong Kong um, um, before and after the national security law uh, is enacted. Um, again, um, to begin with, the, the basic law uh, creates an asymmetric structure between um, the central people's government and um, the, um, uh, the, the, the special um, region. Um, but after, you know, and, and between 1997 and 2003, um, the central government had kind of a hands-off policy. Um, but with the abortion of Article 3 legislation, the central people's government started to substantiate the powers in the basic law. And after uh, 2013, Occupy, Occupy Central social movement and the abortion again of the electoral reform in 2014, together with the popularity of Hong Kong's new identity on the one hand and Chinese scholars political narratives of the central and um, government and special administration relationships in the white paper, um, the result is that the escalator the escalation of tension between uh, the central government and the opposition um, camp uh, in the SAR. Um, the, the last straw uh, seems to be the 2019 protest uh, with the escalation of tension between uh, the opposition um, uh, groups, which you know, expressly, um, you know, um, uh, a target and attacked the central government instead of just the establishment in Hong Kong. Uh, and not only uh, inside the, the SAR, but also uh, it is able to mobilize international naming and shaming, which eventually uh, escalate sort of the tension between the central government and um, the, um, the, the, the opposition um, uh, in, inside Hong Kong. So as a result, um, the equilibrium before the uh, national security law um, was kind of distracted. You know, that in the past, they, you know, there, there was a kind of a checks and balances inside and then there's the overarching power of the um, uh, National People's Congress Standing Committee, but um, that kind of equilibrium was, um, the, the balance inside the equilibrium was, kind of um, uh, losing because of this tension. Um, so to fix this problem, um, the national security law introduces intrusive um, institutions other than try to restore the previous equilibrium. Um, so for example, the NSL uh, created new institutions, new positions, um, inside the government and outside the government, uh, it sent a central government representative as the advisor of the um, Hong Kong government. Uh, it created national security advisor system. It created, um, it, it, again, it to limit the constitutional jurisdiction of the judiciary. And as a result, you know, it, it, the, the balance was shift um, toward um, the executive branch, uh, it sort of weakened the power of the judiciary and it also you know, make the um, legislature uh, less um, powerful as a checking power um, for the government uh, and you know, potentially um, the, 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 the uh, central government. Um, so these are 
um, the, the kind of uh, impacts. So to, to conclude, um, I would like to say that um, because of the national security law, uh, we, we have seen uh, significant uh, changes, um, even though it's probably still too early to see how far this change will go, that we, we could already see uh, the changing um, pattern of power dynamics. Uh, to be precise, um, first of all, the executive branch uh, will be further subjugated to the central people's government with the advisor inside and outside. Second, the national security law will significantly change the election uh, system um, and then you know, uh, will further weaken the influence of the opposition. Um, three, uh, given the fragmentation of, however, on the other hand, I agree with um, many of the other participants that given the fragmentation of Hong Kong's political um, parties, uh, judicial independence is likely to be maintained, but we should also get ready to see more uh, committee and deference from the courts. Uh, I, I'm not too worried about uh, the judicial uh, independence in Hong Kong, but I can see why people are worried. Um, in fact, in, in, you know, uh, a Canadian uh, newspaper asked me, you know, uh, how 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 bad has uh, all these um, you know uh, like uh, bulk, bulk uh, charges in Hong Kong? So it, it seems like Hong Kong overnight has become a um, a, a territory without rule of law, it becomes a, a, a region of rule by law under the, the CCP. Um, I'm, I'm not that pessimistic. In, in fact, I think because of Hong, Hong Kong's kind of um, fragmented um, politics, it's likely that Hong Kong will be able to keep judicial independence, although the judiciary will be less active, but more uh, deferential to some extent. So finally, what, what about one country, two systems? Uh, the one country, two systems uh, is likely to survive, but uh, because you know Hong Kong is still considered as important. Um, Wang Tifan recently addressed this um, um, issue. Um, and also China needs Hong Kong to find a feasible model for an alternative rule-based society, both domestically and national, internationally. And also, um, you know, um, uh, it, it's unlikely for for China to, um, you know, abruptly uh, give up one country, two systems. Given that uh, for for China, Hong Kong is not just a role model for um, Taiwan's uh, integration to China, but also a role model for many other jurisdictions inside China in terms of rule of law, uh, economic development, and uh, in, including uh, social and educational models. Um, on the other hand, even though um, my paper uh, try to avoid normative judgment and, and try to uh, bring more like um, positive um, description, but I, I do believe that there is a normative implication uh, of national um, security law in the sense that, um, even if um, human rights and rule of law is not the major concern of the law, there's, you know, has to be a concern for the central government to promote effectiveness of the law. Um, but with um, the laws being more suppressive and oppressive, instead of promoting communication between uh, the national government or, or China and the Hong Kong society, so there's always a concern of how could the law be like the uh, mediator or the uh, intermediate for a more effective um, communication to facilitate the kind of discourse between the central government and Hong Kong. In, in that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your focused, cautious, and careful uh, uh, analysis. Um, let's uh, move to the second speaker.
Poyen, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dean Fu, for your kind introduction. And also thank you once again for putting together this timely and instructive conference for us to gather and debate uh, this uh, legislation. So my topic today is I would like to look at how Hong Kong courts should judge the NSL. As we all know, in Lai Chi Ying, the CFA handed down its first substantive decision on the NSL. And that case concerned the legal threshold for judges granting bail under Article 42 of the NSL. In this decision, the CFA accepted the constitutionality of the NSL. But I would like to point out one thing, and I think this is a very important thing, and it accepted the constitutionality of the NSL on the basis that counsel on both sides did not argue otherwise. Therefore, if counsel, including counsel for Jimmy Lai, actually argue that the NSL is constitutional, it would not be right for the CFA to rule that it is not, right? So the constitutionality of the NSL was accepted by both sides. And the CFA re-emphasized the relevance of Unkaling number two. And I'll quote from the CFA here, right? In our view, in light of Unkaling number two, the legislative acts of the NPC and the NPCSC done in accordance with the provisions of the basic law and the procedure therein are not subject to review on the basis of any alleged incompatibility between the NSL and the basic law. So what the CFA did here was to, again to re-emphasize and re-quote uh, calling number two. And in both decisions, the CFA actually coyly and I think intentionally avoided addressing the outcome if they take the view that the legislative acts leading to the promulgation of the NSL were not done in accordance with the basic law, right? So they didn't say that it was done in accordance. They were saying that if, they, if anything was done in accordance, it will be constitutional. But they left out the outcome if they take the view that something was not done in accordance with the basic law. And they had no opportunity to address that point because counsel on both sides accepted that every provision was constitutional. So what if counsel in the future were to argue that specific individual provisions in the basic law was un un unconstitutional? How should courts address this issue? Should Hong Kong courts exercise the power to strike down individual NSL provisions that deem inconsistent, like in an a la carte fashion? In my view, the short answer is no. Any such public declaration of invalidity will be a pirate victory as the NPCSC will simply rebuke the courts with an interpretation. One should remember that Ng Ka Ling was reversed within six months we can expect the NS, uh, NPCSC to be even more prompt vis-a-vis -vis the NSL. Without the benefit of hindsight, we will not know how far the NPCSC will go this time as they clip the judicial wings. At the very least, we know that these judges will probably be ousted from hearing future national security cases. There is really no point in winning a battle if you lose the war. In my opinion, right, the most viable path open to a Hong Kong judge or Hong Kong panel is for the court to engage in a remedial interpretation of the NSL. A remedial interpretation of an impugned law is a position whereby courts read in words or read down the legal effect of statutory language without resorting to an outright open declaration of invalidation. Common law courts enjoy inherent and implied powers. 
And the power to engage in remedial interpretation, or RI, is recognized as one of them. The common law continues to apply vis-a-vis -vis the NSL. And in fact, the CFI in Tong Ying Kip even gone on to emphasize that only common law principles will be used to interpret the NSL. The Hong Kong courts have previously used RI in three different ways, but the substantive effect of all these three ways are the same. In all these three ways, additional words are read in into the text of the impugn law. In the first way, the courts will expressly say that this law is unconstitutional and they will expressly adopt RI to modify the law. One such case is W, right, where the right to, uh, right to marry or post-operative transsexuals, the court held that uh, the term woman in the marriage ordinance can, should be judicially read by the CFA to include post-operative male to female transsexuals, such that post-operative transsexuals can now marry in their acquired gender. But vis-a-vis -vis the NSL, for the reasons I've explained above, it will not be prudent for the Hong Kong courts to openly declare any provision of the NSL as expressly unconstitutional. The CFA in Lai Chi has also said that if, if the NSL is constitutional, this express RI cannot be accepted. But if express RI cannot be accepted, there are other two ways the courts can do it. The second way the courts engage in RI is when they construe legislation consistently with the constitution without expressly saying that the law is unconstitutional. And the CFA has also done it. In Yong May 1, the CFA held that the police powers must be construed consistently with the constitutional guarantees against arbitrary arrest. And therefore, the impugn law that permitted a police officer to apprehend a person who the police reasonable, reasonably believes will be charged has to be read to mean that the police reasonably believes will be charged on the basis of a reasonable suspicion that the arrest person is guilty of the offence to be charged. Notice the CFA read into a bunch of sentence into the pre-existing law without declaring the law as unconstitutional. Herein, the remedial reading of the law was justified on the basis that restrictions on constitutional rights must be narrowly construed. And when a statute can be given different interpretations, the court will incline to adopt a meaning that preserves a wider ambit for rights. Finally, the third way of applying RI is when the impugned law is judicially modified under the guise of statutory interpretation and any resort to the basic law is deemed unnecessary. For example, sometimes and often, the text of the law is textually ambiguous and the courts will construe the text in a more rights-friendly outcome. For example, when the penal legislation is silent on mens rea, the CFA often determines that the mental element of a crime is not displaced. So in Choi Wai Lun, the CFA determined that the penal provision that criminalized indecent assault on a minor under the age of 16 did not impose absolute liability on the accused, even though the law stated that a person under the age of 16 cannot give consent, the court decided that this did not absolve the prosecution from proving that mens rea is completely irrelevant. Sorry, what they say, it did not, it only absolved the prosecution from proving that mens rea is irrelevant, but the accused still had a defense if he can prove on a balance of probability that he honestly, reasonably believed that the girl was 16 or above. So even though the law 
was silent on mens rea, the court created a defense for the uh, uh, defendant. Sometimes the textual ambiguity arises from the English text of the law and the court reaches a more rights-friendly friendly outcome from relying on the Chinese version instead. T versus Commissioner of Police is the most instructive example of this. In that case, and this is one of the few cases where the CFA actually split three is to two, the central issue was whether a public road can constitute a place of public entertainment under the Places of Public Entertainment Ordinance, such that a license will be required for, for a performance on a public road. For the majority, the definition of the requirement that the public be admitted to the place is an integral part of that definition. And the use of the word admitted suggests an active sense of giving permission to enter a place such that in their view, a public road, it is not a place for which anyone's permission must be given to enter and therefore exempt from the licensing requirement. On the other hand, the dissent argued that one only needs to be admitted to the entertainment and one doesn't need to be admitted into the venue and therefore the right licensing requirements still prevail. The ambiguity over the meaning of admitted in the ordinance is resolved when one turns to the Chinese text, which one member of the, uh, of the majority pointed to. The use of the word admitted in Chinese is ru chang, yap chong, which reinforces the view that the law is concerned with an admission into a locality, chong, chang, right? And not merely the entertainment itself. And therefore, the CFA says, since the statutory construction was resolved in, in favor of the accused, the majority held that there was no need to look at the basic law. And vis-a-vis -vis the NSL, the CFA in Lai Chi has also implicitly endorsed this third method. So it said this, right? Article 4 and Article 5 of the NSL expressly stipulated that rights, freedoms, and values are to be protected. As far as possible, the NSL is to be given a meaning and effect compatible with those rights found in the NSL. Right? So statutory construction as a means of remedial interpretation. So in view of all these remedial techniques, right, I will now explain how Hong Kong courts can use them to shape the NSL's operative scope. My analysis is meant to be illustrative and not exhaustive, right? All right, number one, terrorism. Terrorism under the NSL has been defined to include sabotage of means of transport for political ends. Does sabotage here include the intentional blocking of train doors or the undue pressing of emergency buttons? My answer is no. While the English text is ambiguous as to whether mere obstruction of train operations would constitute sabotage, one can turn to the Chinese text. The Chinese text uses the words po huai, po wai, which reinforces the view that actual physical damage must be inflicted on the trains for terrorism to be established. As the CFA held in T, right, the Hong Kong courts can use the Chinese text of the law to limit the legislation's operative scope especially since it is a Chinese text and not the English translation, that is, the, that is the only authoritative version of the NSL. Second, state subversion. Right? State subversion has been defined to include any participation in any act that seriously disrupts or undermines the performance of duties and functions of the body of the central party of the PRC or the body of power of the Hong Kong SAR by force or threat of force or other unlawful means. Now, does this law prohibit the mere criticism of the PRC and Hong Kong SAR government if, if any of their laws and policies are undermined as a consequence? In my opinion, the short answer is again, no. 
absent the use of force, or the, sorry, absent the use or threat of the use of force, the putative act that undermines the exercise of state power must be in itself unlawful. Therefore, unless the putative act is independently illegal under any statutory or common law rule, the fact that the act seriously undermines state functions does not in itself constitute a crime under the NSL. Collusion, right? Collusion with foreign powers has been defined to include the indirect and indirect receipt of instructions, funding, or support from a foreign country organization outside of mainland Hong Kong and Macau. Does the prosecution need to prove that the alleged offender know that his sources of support are foreign entities? Or has the law displaced the mental menstrual requirement? The, again, the NSL is silent on this. In my opinion, therefore, the Hong Kong courts should identify an, an appropriate menstrual alternative for this statutory provision so as to safeguard the presumption of innocence. So in my opinion, menstrua is not displaced, even though the law is silent. Beijing's muscular assertion of state power in Hong Kong has rightly raised alarm. But while the law is a done deal, its interpretation is not. In the coming months, as the NSL cases snake their way through the appeals process, the Hong Kong judiciary will face an interpretive dilemma. And this is its dilemma. How can the judiciary preserve its autonomy while quelling Beijing's concerns that the Hong Kong courts, if left unleashed, would turn the city into another renegade province in the South? If the CFA unshackles the NSL from the basic law, Beijing will simply circumvent this ruling with an interpretation that censure the court and circumscribe its powers further. On the other hand, if the CFA or the judiciary capitulate on all NSL controversies, the NSL will become the Trojan horse that turns Hong Kong into Shenzhen South. The Hong Kong judiciary cannot hollow out the NSL but it can read it down. If the courts do not challenge China's right to rule, Beijing in turn will tolerate the judge's choice to trim the NSL's operative scope. This is not some phantasm of hope on my part. Hong Kong's viability, continued viability, as an international financial center undergirded by a respected independent judiciary is indispensable to Beijing for linking the mainland to the world so that to the world's economy so that China can generate capital in Hong Kong to fund its global political ambitions abroad. Socialism with Chinese characteristics just means capitalism without democracy. And new capitalist China cannot afford an exodus of multinational companies from Hong Kong to Singapore. So long as the Hong Kong judiciary accepts Beijing's plenary constitutional prerogatives, China will in turn also overlook occasional contratemps over the interpretive scope of the NSL. For Hong Kong judges, the rhetoric of transformation that Ng Kaling Harrods must now give way to the realities of accommodation. Remedial interpretation is not mere pal palaver, for it's the arcana of judging. Thank you. Uh, Paul Jim, um, for this uh, cautiously optimistic uh, reading of the future. So I think you will have uh, two papers uh, looking at the respective crystal balls 
trying to forecast in uh, the future of uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> um, so now we have uh, two speakers. The third speaker is our Johannes. Um, so Johannes, so you have the final word on this uh, significant issue. Okay, so. Thank you, Wani. Um, the paper that I wrote um, focused on the judiciary and the independence of the judiciary. Um, and given the rather vague and general nature of the NSL, there is a lot of hopes on the judiciary that they can limit the scopes uh, in a way uh, that the common law system is familiar with. Uh, and what I try to do is look at how the judiciary has actually performed so far. Uh, this is tentative in the sense that uh, we do not yet have a substantive decisions from the court. Uh, on the other hand, there are sufficient cases around that at least we can get a glimpse of what we are uh, to expect. Um, the paper put that also in terms of the underlying values uh, of the judiciary. Uh, and to start off is that there are two very different views about the judiciary. Uh, in the common law system, the judiciary is regarded as a foundation of the rule of law and the guardians of fundamental rights. Uh, and whereas across the border, the judiciary is basically part of the government administrations with a duty to give effect to law and government policies under the central government's leadership. These are two very different models of the judiciary. Uh, the tension exists from day one, but then over the years, and particularly with the onset of the NSL, the tensions becomes intensified. Um, a lot have been said about the NSL already, so I, I won't say too much about the substantive or the preliminary matters. Um, however, one clear message from the NSL is that there is an impression of a general distrust of the judiciary. And I classify the provisions into three categories to show this distrust. Uh, the first is the general directives. Uh, the second are a cluster of provisions which restrict judicial discretion and the third are the, uh, another group of provisions which simply oust the jurisdictions of the courts. Uh, the general directives are Article 3 and Article 8, uh, and particular Article 8 that expressly stated that judiciary has a duty to prevent, suppress, punish acts, activities, endangering national security, and the duty to enforce the law. To the common law lawyer, this is purely stating the obvious. Uh, it must be the role of the court to enforce the law, so this is redundant. Uh, in the Chinese systems, uh, the general directives always set the tone uh, and the guiding principles of how the law is to be interpreted. So far, we haven't seen anything on that, but it seems that uh, this general directives, in a way, already set the parameters of how creative the court could be uh, in departing from the aims of the NSL. Uh, the second group of uh, provisions, uh, we have touched on some of that already, uh, the CE power to designate uh, NSL judges, uh, the restriction to grants bail, the certificate of the Secretary for Justice to direct a jury, uh, to trial without a jury, and all these, I'll say something more about it. There are also other evidential provisions uh, given the power to CE uh, and to direct a closed door trial as well as a, a national evidential proof on what constitutes or what uh, um, involve the uh, um, national security. And then there's the third group of uh, provisions which simply oust the jurisdictions of the court uh, and no jurisdictions over decisions of the National Security Committee. Uh, there's no, uh, this committee is not subject to uh, any order of disclosure, uh, no jurisdictions over acts performed by the National Security Office staff, even when they are said to be abide by the laws of the Hong Kong SAR, which creates a strange situation that these staff are subject to Hong Kong law, but no court has jurisdiction over them. Uh, and then, of course, the very controversial Article 55, which under certain conditions, that National Security Office has power to remove someone from the jurisdictions. Uh, and once removed from the jurisdictions, that person is no longer under Hong Kong court or Hong Kong law. Uh, and apparently the mainland systems will apply. Um, 
the power of interpretation is vested in the NSL. Uh, a quick overview so far by the end of April, uh, around 100 people were arrested under NSL. At least eight cases are pending trial uh, involving 47 pro-democracy uh, politicians and activists involved in the primary of the electrical elections. Uh, at the same time, uh, arising from the social arrest in 2019, over 10,000 people were arrested. Uh, around 2,500 were prosecuted. Uh, quite a number of them were not granted bail. Uh, and the recent listing situation in some of these cases are listed for trial in 2023. So which means quite a number of these people will be detained, detained pending trial for over two years. Uh, interestingly, uh, no police officer has ever been charged. There's only one private prosecution against a police officer, and that has been intervened uh, by the Secretary for Justice by entering a nolly. Uh, and there's also a hotline, uh, and apparently, according to the reports, uh, the hotline has received over 10,000 reports of alleged violation of NSL. Uh, um, and just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the newspaper report that a students make a complaint against an assistant professor at Hong Kong U, uh, and there are other academics who have been publicly accused. I'll uh, look at a few uh, uh, cases in slightly more detail. Uh, Hong Kong Kid has generated a lot of cases, which is a familiar case, which have been discussed by a number of my colleagues already. Uh, this case concerns Article 42 about bail. Uh, there's, of course, Article 4 and Article 5, uh, which some of my colleagues have already alluded to. The human rights provisions have been retained. Uh, the presumption of innocence has been expressly uh, preserved. Um, of interest is that um, at this point, I should point out that Article 42 is framed in a double negative manner. No bail shall be granted unless just satisfied the defendant will not continue. Uh, to commit further acts endangering national security. Uh, when the case first came before the court, uh, a magistrate refused bail. The case then went on, and the applicants decided to apply for habeas corpus and review of the decisions denying bail. Uh, a divisional bench uh, comprising Mr. Justice uh, Chow, as he then was, and Mr. Justice Lee, uh, decide uh, in uh, a very interesting decisions which I would recommend to anyone. Uh, who wants to read the common law approach to NSL, uh, they um, start with Article 4 and 5, that NSL is to be construed consistently with the basic law and the ICCPR that is mandated by Article 4 and 5. The court should give a generous interpretation to rights. The court has a duty to protect fundamental rights. So common law approach should be adopted in construing the NSL. Uh, so none of these are surprising to any common law lawyers or, or anyone uh, familiar with the system in Hong Kong. And so they conclude, as a result, Article 42 does not change the existing principle on bail by applying these principles. And they said, notwithstanding these double negative formulations, uh, they reformulate the question of bail. And what they did is they changed the double negative into a positive statement. So namely, the test is whether there are grounds to believe uh, that the defendants will uh, uh, continue to commit any acts of endangering national security. And by this reformulating the test, uh, and what they said basically is uh, the likelihood of committing NSL offense, that is just a mandatory factor that needs to be considered. Uh, and in any event, in, under the laws of Hong Kong, the likelihood of committing further offense is always a factor to be considered. So in short, they said that while there's uh, maybe a difference of emphasis between the existing law under the Criminal Procedure Ordinance and Article 42, the impact of Article 42 is more apparent than real. And the ap practical application of Article 42 is unlikely to result in any different outcome of a bail application in the vast majority of cases. And Article 42 should not even be read as imposing a presumption against bail. Uh, probably this would fit in well with Pogen's uh, description of a remedial interpretation. Unfortunately, it was overruled. Uh, before we leave that case, uh, the court also says something about the designated judge system, uh, and the bench reject the argument that the designated system, judge system is an inroad to judicial independence. Uh, it points out that the power to assign judges is still vested in the judiciary uh, and the power to designate is only a general power. 
Also, and this power does not affect the tenure of a judge. And as the court points out, uh, a judge will not suddenly become partial simply because he was designated as a designated judge. Uh, and uh, as far as the prospect of not being reappointed uh, as some kind of discipline on the judge, the court also reject that. Uh, by saying implicit in this argument is that somehow advantageous or beneficial for a judge to be designated to handle cases concerning offenses endangering national security. This is completely unfound, uh, a very laudable statement, uh, and, but it leaves unanswered then. Uh, if that is the case, why should there be such a power in the first place? Uh, why should the discretion of the judiciary be fettered uh, yes, the judiciary will still assign cases, but they could only assign cases only uh, within the group of designated judge. Uh, and so far, we do not know how many judge have been designated. In some courts, it appears that only one judge has been designated. So what is the discretion there? Uh, and, and why create a list of government approved judges? Uh, it doesn't look good as a matter of impressions. Uh, and whether the removal of the designation by the CE, even if it is done on goodwill, could that be perceived as a kind of discipline on judges? Uh, and why is there a secrecy, complete secrecy about the designation you won't know until a judge is assigned to try a case? Uh, and so far when the press asked who, which judge had been designated, both the CE office and the judiciary refused to disclose that. And one immediate impact we can see on the designated judges uh, is that uh, it limited the number of judges available to handle NSL cases. Uh, inevitably, that could result in delay, uh, and both in bail application, as we have seen in the primary case, uh, as well as uh, in the listing of the trials that will be coming. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as far as the uh, divisional bench is concerned, uh, they denied habeas corpus uh, and on review of the bail applications, uh, Mr. Justice Lee uh, decides to deny bail uh, based on the facts of that case. Um, then we have the Jimmy Lai's case. Uh, uh, the interesting thing of the Jimmy Lai's case is also decided by Mr. Justice Lee. Uh, and there are two charges initially. One is a fraud charge, uh, and which relates to a breach of conditions of user in the land lease. Uh, and that breach apparently relates to a very small part of the land. Uh, of the land. Uh, and as the, uh, Mr. Justice Lee points out, uh, this sounds like uh, more uh, a civil matter, more than a criminal matter. In the normal type of cases, bail will be granted as a routine if the charge is fraud. The other is the collusion with a foreign country or foreign elements to endanger national security. And the judge pointed out that as far as the evidence is uh, concerned, while this is not a definite view, the judge seems to get an impression that this is he's just expressing his view rather than any collusions there. So the prosecution case was very weak uh, and the evidence is tenuous. And on that basis, the court is prepared to grant bail under very stringent conditions. So in a way, is the court taking into account the cases as a whole, including the strength of the prosecution case to decide bail, which is again, a common approach under the common law. The case went on appeal uh, to the Court of Final Appeal uh, and the Court of Final Appeal uh, reject that approach. Uh, it did refer to Article 4 and Article 5 of the NSL, but it seems that they are relied upon to deal with uh, what I would call some peripheral issues. When it comes to the main issues, uh, the court accepts readily that Article 42 reversed the common law presumption of bail uh, and set a high threshold for granting bail in all national security cases. Uh, it introduced a two-stage approach so that in the first stage, the only question is whether the defendant will commit any national security offense while on bail. If there's no sufficient reason to believe that, uh, bail will be denied and other factors, uh, strain for prosecution case, etc., that will only come after you go through the first hurdle. And if you can't go through the first hurdle, they are irrelevant. And the difference between the call of first instance and the call of final appeal lies in the approach to interpret Article 42. As I point out, Article 42 is framed in a double negative way. The call of final, the call of first instance, uh, as mentioned before, is the double negative means the two double negative cancel one another, and therefore that becomes a positive statement. So a positive statement means that bail shall be granted 
unless there is evidence pointing to the contrary. Uh, and the court has to be satisfied. There's positive evidence showing that defendant will continue to commit crimes. The CFA did not accept that. And they said that bail shall be granted only that were, unless it's changed into only, uh, and then they retain one part. So when the judge is satisfied, the defendant will not continue to commit acts endangering national security. So the judge has to be satisfied of a negative state of affair. And if the evidence is either way, he may or may not continue, you cannot pass the threshold, bail will be denied. Reading it just um, objectively, I would say both versions uh, is, could be supported by a uh, literal interpretation. The language itself is vague enough to support either version. Uh, but, and in that situation, if you cannot decide, or uh, if two different versions are equally possible, one should be guided by other values, uh, including the values underlying the bail regime, uh, the fundamental rights, et cetera. And it is here that we do not see the Court of Final Appeal rely on Article 4 and 5, uh, but instead readily accept there is a reversal of the presumption of bail. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, we can see that a large number of people, uh, roughly at the moment, less around 20% of persons who were charged with NSL were able to grant bail. Um, and some of the, the reasons for not granting bail uh, is a bit flimsy, uh, and that happens in the uh, primary case. Uh, as mentioned, 47 politicians and ex electrical members were charged. Uh, and the, that case itself raised a number of, of, in, uh, of questions of concern. One is it produced a marathon bail application that lasts for four days. And probably the only reason why that is the case is because there's only one designated judge who can deal with that. Uh, other judges cannot help because they are not designated. Uh, another interesting uh, practice is that uh, the prosecution expressly state that they are not ready to proceed and they ask the case to uh, be adjourned for a couple of months and yet they oppose bail. Now, it is not uncommon uh, in the past that the police, when they charge a defendant, uh, they uh, will bring the matter to court uh, and while they are still preparing or further investigating the case. But when it put in the context of NSL, in the normal situation when a defendant was charged with an offense, uh, and while police or the prosecution need further time to investigate, bail will be granted, or at least there is a presumption of bail. But here there is a presumption against bail. Now then that would result in uh, lengthy pretrial detentions. And in a way, the judgment of the CFA may encourage a practice of just charging people with an NSL offense knowing that you could be in jail for another 18 months and so on, doesn't really matter at the end whether you were prosecuted or not. Uh, the message has already been passed. Uh, whether that would be a, a, a practice that uh, would grow into uh, a common parlor, we do not know, but at least that is the danger. The other case, uh, the right to jury trial, was also raised in Tong Ying Kit uh, when the Secretary for Justice decides to issue a certificate. Uh, to direct a trial without jury on various grounds stated in the NSL. Uh, at the court of first instance, the court ruled that there was no right to jury. Uh, there was an earlier decision from the court of final appeal saying that because only high court trial has jury trial and it is for the Secretary for Justice to decide which court to uh, prosecute. Uh, so there's no general right to jury trial. So what Colin keep argue in this case is that may be so, but once the Secretary for Justice has decided that the case should be tried in the High Court, then there is a right to jury trial. Uh, and the court, High Court rejected that on, on, on two principal grounds. Uh, the first ground is that uh, once it is in the High Court, there is a right, uh, the jury trial will be there. The defendant has no right to waive that. And if you have no right to waive it, that is not a right. You cannot have a right of something, but you can't waive it. Now, that is a bit peculiar. You have no right to allow yourself to be killed. Uh, doesn't mean you have no right to life. Uh, and the second uh, reason is that um, even if the case was tried at the high court on application, the court can re uh, remit the case back to the district court. And as a result, there is no right to jury trial. So therefore, uh, this is inconsistent with a right to jury trial. And again, that overlooks that a right could be subject to limits. Uh, the fact that it is subject to limits by court order doesn't mean there is no rights there. 
Uh, but the worrying thing is uh, how ready the court is prepared to give up the rights to jury trial. The case went on appeal and the Court of Appeal delivered its judgment a few days ago. Uh, and despite the wealth of common law that described the immense value and unique features of jury trial in the common law, and many of those decisions uh, um, describe jury trial as a right, uh, the Court of Appeal ruled that there is no freestanding right to jury trial. Uh, they even further downplay jury trial is just a matter in the mode of trial, and it is a matter for prosecutory discretion. As the court pointed out, a requirement for jury trial refers to the mode of the criminal trial that must be adopted in the CFA. It's part of a criminal procedure only, uh, and uh, it does not accept that there is a jury trial. Even more concerned uh, is how the court um, comes to this conclusion. Now, it first referred to the interpretation of NSL requires its provision to be examined. I mean, in the light of the context and purpose as a whole. Now, that's the common law approach generally to interpret a domestic legislation. Uh, one cannot uh, uh, fault the court for adopting that uh, to treat NSL as a legislation so you interpret in the context of context and purpose uh, and then adopt the common law technique of purposive contextual approach. Again, you can't fault it for that. Uh, so NSL 46 has to be examined in light of general context as a whole taking into account the constitutional basis upon which the NSL is applied to Hong Kong. Now, the language here subtly changed. It is no longer a piece of legislation, but the constitutional basis. And the contextual approach or purposive approach of interpreting a domestic legislation is very different from the purposive approach of interpreting a constitution. And then as national law applied to Hong Kong, SAR, the NSL has a special constitutional status uh, focusing on uh, safeguarding national security and so on. So it is in no unclear term that it is now having a constitutional status. Uh, the awkward result is having be, being a constitutional provision, you adopt that generous interpretation. Uh, it is fine if it is a constitution conferring right, but here this is a constitution which are restricting right, and you give con a, a broad and purposive approach. Uh, and that's how they reach the conclusion. Uh, the courts say, start with the, it should not be assumed, jury trial is the only means of achieving fairness in criminal process. Uh, they accept that there can be no inconsistency between NSL and the basic law, in a way, uh, uh, reading that that is the conclusion of the CFA. Uh, and while Pojan mentioned there are still room for argument, the CFA basically accept that uh, no inconsistency. So, the court said that let, let's try to construe it as a whole consistently uh, with NSL, with the basic law, with the jury trial, and so on, and, and put it together. Uh, and by reading them together, uh, they point out that under the basic law, issuing a certificate is the prosecutorial decisions, no different in nature from a decision on the venue of trial. So to decide on the venue of trial is equated as the same as uh, a right to jury trial. And then they said, even if there is a right to jury trial in the CFA entrenched in the basic law, the decisions by the court, to, by the Secretary for Justice to issue a non-jury trial certificate under NSL is a prosecutorial decision protected by basic law 63 and the decision is not amenable to conventional judicial review challenge. Now my query is if they accept that the right to jury trial is entrenched by the basic law, should it not be the correct approach that any procedural discretion should only be exercised subject to the entrenched right rather than the other way around? And the court also pointed out that the timely disposal of national security case militates against judicial review challenges against uh, the secretary certificates uh, because it will bleed, elaborate, protract the satellite positions, etc. And no need as a result, no need to provide any reasonable factual basis for issuing the certificate. Uh, the ground is that there might be the jury's uh, uh, safety may be in danger, but that is basically a recital of the grounds in the NSL, but what is the factual basis for that? Uh, and it has been a long principles of interpretation that there is a presumption that any public power should only be exercised rationally and rationally and fairly means there must be some evidential basis for the exercise of this power. And how could it be square? 
uh, with the approach here, uh, which means that the grant is merely an incantation uh, of the statutory provisions. Uh, a few words on a few other cases. Pantakshi is a case uh, which the defendant was charged for seditious, uttering seditious words, not under the NSL, but under Section 10 of the Crimes Ordinance. Uh, but the, the court readily accede that although it is not an NSL offense, firstly, only a designated judge should try uh, this case. And secondly, the principle of presumption against bail applies equally. So the NSL provisions was applied to a non-NSL offense by analogy. Uh, the analogy is that this is worse contrary to Section 10 of the Crimes Ordinance is by nature uh, an offense endangering national security. Now, that seems to be contradictory to the well acceptable principles of legality. If the parliament intends to take away its right, it has to take away with the clear wordings and not by borrowing a provision in another uh, ordinance which has nothing to do with the crimes ordinance as such. Then we have another case uh, uh, which is involves the 818 case of a novel assembly uh, without going into the details. Uh, there is no dispute, and it's all agreed that the unauthorized assembly was entirely peaceful and lasts for only a few hours. Uh, and the court basically treat that knowing that it is an unauthorized, uh, there is a propensity that it becomes violent uh, and therefore uh, as, as it has to be regarded seriously and 18 months was adopted as a starting point, which deviates from all previous sentencing uh, principles. Uh, and, but effectively, it means uh, an unauthorized assembly will be treated as equivalent to a non-peaceful assembly. And whether you could have a peaceful assembly depends now very much on whether the police is prepared to provide the authorization. So if we take a, a quick look at what has happened in the last years, uh, and I just focus on things that we have lost through the judicial process, uh, notwithstanding Article 4 and 5 of the NSL, we lost the presumption of innocence. Uh, we lost the right to speedy trial, uh, partly because uh, a very high threshold for bail has been raised uh, because of the designated judge systems. Uh, and as a result of that, we lost the right to be subject to prolonged pretrial detention. Uh, we lost the right of the judiciary to decide on its own the assignment of judges to cases. Uh, we lost the right to jury trial, which is now a matter of procedural discretions. Uh, there are other cases which I have not referred to, the equality before the law. We have two very similar cases dealing with obtaining vehicle registration information, uh, and, and they both defendants were charged with uh, an offence uh, in breach of uh, privacy uh, concerns, uh, but with very different uh, treatment, which cannot be easily explained. Uh, we have now the right to peaceful assembly depends on the authorization from the police. Uh, the court in various cases has readily accepted, both in the bail and in the jury trial, that the NSL creates a different procedure of criminal justice. So we have two forms of parallel criminal justice, one for NSL offense and the others. Uh, and it's not just for NSL offense, but offense which by analogy is NSL, which could include a lot of public offenses, public order offenses. Um, we have extension of non-existent procedure by analogy to offenses outside the NSL. Uh, and uh, apparently uh, a number of recent prosecutions rely on evidence uh, that were uh, in existence before the NSL was enacted. Uh, and sometimes uh, this is used by um, the very uh, dubious use of conspiracy or incitement or conspiracy as a result. So matters before 1990, uh, before the enactment of NSL could be taken into account. Uh, and we have the issues of search warrant for journalistic materials uh, without compliance with CAP 1. Uh, and under the NSL, it allows the magistrate to issue warrants uh, for search without reference to journalistic materials. Uh, and journalistic material is expressly provided for and protected under CAP 1 with a special procedures. One would have thought that a generous judicial interpretation could um, impose uh, that kind of procedures or requirement. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, and the issuance of search warrants seems to be done as a matter of routine. Uh, and the generous and purposive approach to interpret rights becomes a generous and purposive approach to interpret the restriction of rights. So um, 
the conclusion, in a way, it is a challenging time for the judiciary and the rule of law. I agree with Pojan uh, that there is a dilemma for the court. Uh, and a very difficult time. But so far, the Court of Final Appeal has set a rather conservative tone to the interpretation of the NSL. Uh, and so far, the various courts' performance does not give uh, very good hope that the court is going to invoke innovative remedial interpretation to NSL. And one must remember that when the court applies a law which takes away fundamental right, the confidence in the court and judicial independence is shaken even though the fault lies in the law, not with the judge who applies it, and that would strike at the foundation of the rule of law. I also agree with uh, other commentators, yes, judges are still independent, uh, but one must remember that the rule of law is more than just about law and order, uh, and worse still is what we have seen is a differential approach and also a gradual internalization uh, of certain values uh, that uh, we have uh, treasure before seems to be changed in a way uh, by internalization of the court. So, but by adopting that kind of differential value, the court may be providing rationalization and intellectual justifications for a rather authoritarian regimes. And it is true that the common law are uh, innovative, is resilient, uh, but the resilience and innovations are subject to strenuous tests. And if the court is not seen to be vigorous in defending fundamental rights, the public will soon lose confidence in the judiciary. And independence of the judiciary is not just about whether the judges are independent, but also the perception whether judges are independent. And at this juncture, uh, we hope that uh, we still have case, substantive case uh, coming, and we hope to see uh, further signs of this innovation and resilience and the role of the lawyers and judges is more critical than ever. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Johannes, for this a very grounded critique of the, uh, the uh, uh, judicial practice in the past year. Um, now, we invite Cora to give her uh, comment. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by congratulating Kualing, Michael, and all the authors for putting together this magnificent collection. Um, uh, it, it really is a timely and very meaningful collection. Um, thanks also for giving me the chance to comment on three terrific chapters. My comments are not going to be able to do justice to the sophisticated and rich analysis in those chapters. I'm just gonna pick up on a few issues that um, came up either in individually in the chapters or across the chapters. The first issue, is whether Hong Kong courts have jurisdiction to review Chinese acts for compatibility with the basic law. It's an issue that has been raised in Po Jen's paper, uh, Professor Chung's paper, and, and also a number of uh, other authors' papers. And uh, Po Jen made a very important observation in his paper, which he didn't manage to present in his presentation. Um, he observed that we are now seeing a disjuncture between the CFA's position on this issue uh, on the one hand, and the CFI and CA's positions on this issue on the other hand. So on the one hand, we have the CFA's Nkaling line of jurisprudence, uh, which Nkaling one, which asserts jurisdiction in hard form, basically the court saying that courts may refuse to apply legislative acts of Beijing, which in its view fall foul of the basic law. This high point, has not been expressly overruled by, or at least can be reconciled with the subsequent cases of Ng Ka Ling Tu and Lao Kong Yong. And in Ng Ka Ling Tu, um, the court um, said that courts cannot challenge the authority of the NPC or the Standing Committee to do any act which is in accordance with the provisions of the basic law and the procedure therein. Um, this is an important statement, and I'm, a, I'm gonna call it the clarificatory statement because I'm gonna come back to this statement in a while. And during that period, the, the high point of assertion of constitutional jurisdiction, we also have Chong Fung Yun from um, the, the CFA, which is willing to challenge Chinese acts in softer terms by reading down an NPCSC interpretation. So before 2021, uh, the line of jurisprudence from Ng Ka Ling and Chong Fung Yun has not been expressly overruled by the CFA itself. 
Uh, we have the CFA refusing to grant leave to revisit, to revisit some of those issues, but the position in Inkarling, the high point in Inkarling and Chongqing has not been expressly overruled. Then um, we arrived at 2021, and we have a nuanced development on this issue in the CFA's judgment of Lai Qiying, which Po Jen has touched upon. Um, on the one hand, as it's a nuanced development, because on the one hand, as Po Jen um, has put it, the CFA in Lai Qing appears to reassert the Nkaling II line of jurisprudence. The CFA stated in, in, in restates in Lai Qing the clarificatory statement uh, given in Nkaling II, and it uh, stated that if Chinese acts complied with conditions stated in the basic law for Chinese organs exercise of power or, or what can be termed virus or jurisdictional conditions. So if Chinese acts comply with the jurisdictional conditions stated in, in the basic law, then those acts cannot be reviewed for compatibility with other substantive provisions of the basic law. The CFA in Lai Qing um, also asserted supremacy in softer forms, holding, for example, that the court should try to construe NSO provisions compatibly with the basic law. But on the other hand, so on one hand, it, it seems to reassert Nkaling too, but on the other hand, um, it retreats from the Nkaling line of jurisprudence in um, two ways. First, um, the CFA in Lai Qing clarifies an ambiguity in the Nkaling line of jurisprudence, thereby closing off a role that the Inkaling line of jurisprudence could be read as allowing the Hong Kong courts to play. Let me explain. Inkaling one and Inkaling two left open the possibility of the Hong Kong courts reviewing Chinese acts for compliance, not just with the jurisdictional conditions stated in the basic law, but with substantive provisions as well. So Inkaling one and Inkaling two left open the possibility of the Hong Kong courts exercising not just virus review, but substantive review um, of Chinese acts with the basic law as well. In Lai Qing, however, for the first time, the CFA um, made it very clear that the CFA's review power, if any, review power, if any, over Chinese acts is restricted to jurisdictional review only. Um, and so that's the first way in which the CFA in Lai Qing retreated from the the the, the in calling a line of jurisprudence. The second way in which the CFA and Lai Chain retreated from that line of jurisprudence um, is that um, while the court was strong in its assertion of hard and soft techniques uh, in, in reviewing Chinese acts, it was very relaxed in exercising that review in the case in question. I think, and I think this point is a point that came up in um, it was asked by Alden in, in, in the, in the Q&A. Um, so in other words, the CFA's relaxed application of hard and soft techniques in reviewing Chinese acts rendered the retention of these techniques of little practical effect in the case in question. But such retention left the door to courts challenging Chinese acts ajar by reaffirming those techniques in principle. And uh, Pojan made a really, really extremely interesting observation in relation to um, whether the, the CFA in Lai Qing, whether the CFA's um, finding that the NSL was made in accordance with the basic law and the pr procedures therein, whether that finding is in fact made in obiter because it was made on the basis that uh, it wasn't disputed before the court. Um, if Pogen's reading of the case is correct, meaning that that finding was in fact obiter, then it means that the door to challenging the constitutionality of the NSL uh, was also left ajar. Although I do have some reservations on, on that reading of the case, because I think um, the, 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 the point about the constitutionality of the NSL was actually challenged by um, the, the other party in the written submissions. But I agree with Pojan absolutely that the court was very coy and not upfront about that point. If you read that judgment, the terminology that they use, um, the wording that they used is very unusual. They're very 
coy about, they're very not upfront about saying that the NSL uh, was passed in a manner that complies with um, the procedures in, in, the, in the basic law. So um, that is just, um, uh, uh, so, 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 that, so there we go. We have the CFA's line of jurisprudence, the high point um, in Nkaling and Chongfeng Yun, um, not having really been retreated um, until 2021, uh, and this Court of Final Appeal in Lai Qing uh, retreated slightly from that position, but um, not, not entirely, at least at, in, in terms of principle. Uh, but at the same time, so that's the CFA jurisprudence, but at the same time, we have this parallel universe of the CFI and CA, which have completely ignored the Nkaling and Chongfeng Yun jurisprudence. Um, the CFI and CA have categorically stated once and again that Hong Kong courts have no jurisdiction to query Chinese acts, and they've also refused to read down Chinese acts. The cumulative effect of these lower courts' decisions is that they give full force to Chinese acts, regardless of whether those acts comply with the basic laws, jurisdictional conditions, or substantive provisions. So we're, we're seeing, as Po Jen has put it, we're seeing a disjuncture in which the CFI and CA effectively ruled out challenges to Chinese acts. But on the other hand, the CFA has been more cautious, leaving open the theoretical possibility of a jurisdictional challenge. The possibility remained theoretical so far. It has not materialized so far, but its preservation leaves space um, for constitutional imagination. Um, the second point that I would like to pick up, um, it's a small um, point, but, um, but I, I saw that it's a point that has been asked by an anonymous um, uh, um, member of the audience. Um, but um, the use of the term remedial interpretation, I think Poe Jen has used the term remedial interpretation in a broad sense to include both the reading down of provisions during the adjudication of the, of the merits. Um, for example, applying the principle of legality to read provi statutory provisions in line with common law or constitutional rights. Um, so a broad reading of remedial interpretation, understanding remedial interpretation, that includes these instances of reading down of provisions, as well as the reading down of provisions during the remedy stage. So after finding a provision to be unconstitutional, as a remedy, the court um, decides to read down that provision in order to, as a remedy um, to, to, to the litigant. Um, and I think that has been, um, there has been some confusion both in the Court of Final Appeal uh, in Lai Qing, as well as amongst um, some commentators as to what is the meaning of remedial interpretation. And I think the more common usage of the term remedial interpretation is to use it in a narrow sense to refer to um, the reading down of provisions at the remedial stage only. Or, but, but I know this is a quibble. It's, it's not really um, a very consequential uh, point. Um, and uh, uh, Pojan, I, I think your suggestions on how the NSO should be read down is excellent. Uh, and I think courts and jurists are going to find them very, very useful. So congratulations on, on this paper. The, um, uh, second, the third issue that I wanted to pick up is um, concerns the reduced power of the courts under the new security regime. Uh, Professor Cheng gave us an illuminating account on how the NSL has transferred powers from the courts and legislature to the executive, uh, as well as transferred powers from the local to the central government, um, how there's been changing power dynamics. Um, it's, a, it's a really illuminating paper. And Johannes's chapter has offered a systematic analysis of how the NSL potentially affects judicial independence. Um, he categorizes the NSL's restrictions on the judiciary into three types, general admonitions on judicial behavior, provisions restricting judicial discretion, as well as provisions removing the jurisdiction of the courts altogether. Uh, his presentation also provided a, a very comprehensive overview of the enforcement and adjudication of the NSO so far, which is really very, very valuable. So thank you very much for com coming up with those slides. I, I won't be able to comment um, in, in detail um, those slides. Um, I'm just going to make 
a number of observations on the idea of judicial independence. First, I think we can distinguish judicial autonomy from judicial independence. The former relates to the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong courts vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese authorities, whereas the latter relates to the independence of the judicial mind in adjudication vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the political authorities, whether at the central or local level. The two concepts are, of course, interrelated. Each of them is meaningful only because the other is intact, but conceptually they are distinct. And Johannes, um, and, and to some extent, um, Professor Cheng as well, have explained how the NSL uh, impacted on both, both judicial autonomy and judicial independence. Both judicial autonomy and judicial independence can in turn be distinguished from a third concept, namely the duty of the courts to arrive at correct answers to legal issues that a judge has jurisdiction over an issue and has come to an issue independently does not mean that the judgment is correct. If the judge himself is a bigot, uh, is under or overly protective of rights, then even if he has arrived at the decision independently, the balances that he has struck might still be wrong or unjustified. And the ability of judges to arrive at correct outcomes in cases that involve the balancing of values depends inter alia on how well they understand the world. Um, the chance of a bench arriving at a correct decision is increased when there is diversity on the bench. The NSL potentially weakens the ability of a bench to arrive at correct outcomes in security cases by giving the chief executive an opportunity to select judges of a particular disposition that is, those who are pro-state on security matters. A second observation uh, on judicial independence, um, threats to judicial independence can come from numerous sources, uh, express indications of preferences by political authorities could be one source, and this is a point that has been raised in um, Johannes's paper. Another source is, um, as recognized by Johannes, the court's internalization of the ethos of the ruling party, internalization of uh, pressure, or we could call these instances of self-immolation by the courts in the absence of any directives from the political authorities. Johannes um, highlights in his paper, what is special about this source of threat as compared to express pressure from the authorities? Well, first of all, it is less blatant uh, it enables the rulers to achieve their political goals without any cost to their legitimacy. Uh, its effects are also more long term. Uh, indeed, there is a risk that the courts would apply the internalized ideology to even non-politically sensitive cases. And if that happens, the common law would be reconstituted um, or, or hollowed out, um, in the words of Pogen and other commentators. Internalization of Beijing's ideology could be rationalized by the courts under the banner of harmonizing the divergent legal traditions of the two jurisdictions by developing a unique Hong Kong brand of common law. And the need for the harmonization is underlined in the recent co-location judgment by the CA, which held that on matters that lie at the interface of the two systems, Hong Kong courts should strive for an interpretation of the basic law that conforms with the Chinese system's understanding thereof. A related and final observation on judicial independence concerns the methodology for discerning whether judicial independence has been compromised. I note that in um, Johannes's paper and a number of other commentators' papers, um, uh, it has been the, the point has been made that our judges are still independent. Um, and I, as I was reading that, I did wonder how, what is the basis for saying what is the basis of saying that? I, of course, there is no direct evidence that um, judicial independence has been impaired. Uh, but at the same time, we, we don't have direct evidence that judicial independence has not been impaired uh, as well, especially when judgments are pro-government, reasoning is bad, uh, and there are prudential and political reasons um, for, for deference. So I think that the, 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 the thing is, it is extremely difficult to find direct evidence of independence being compromised. The courts are not going to say explicitly that 
um, they are yielding to political pressure. And of course, if, the, if they've internalized uh, the ethos of, 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 of the Chinese government, they're not gonna say that either. So as academics, we can only infer. Um, and if one were to conduct a systematic study on judicial independence in post NSO judgments, uh, tentatively, I think it would be acceptable to code a judgment as a non-independent judgment if um, three conditions are satisfied. First, the outcome is in favor of the government. That would be a quantitative um, method. But combined with second, a qualitative um, methodology, that there are clear gaps in the reasoning of the court. Um, the, the, the decision cannot be explained um, sufficient, persuasively by text or doctrine. And finally, third, um, there are prudential reasons uh, for deference in, in that particular case. Um, and finally, to end my presentation, uh, a, a final theme um, that has come up in, in Johannes's presentation, what have we lost? Um, uh, Johannes gave us a poignant catalog of yes. what it really is, very, very poignant, and you've delivered it in a really compelling way. Um, a poignant catalog of what we've lost within a year. And the, and the scary thing about that list is that it keeps growing um, week by week, if not day by day. And it, it affects not just political and security matters, but so many aspects of our daily lives. So even if you're not a political activist, you would want to watch a documentary about the 2019 protests as well. You might wish to go to the June 4th vigil uh, or, or read Apple Daily. So it is very poignant indeed. Um, and it, it is clear that um, the NSL has consolidated, the NSL, but also uh, more generally what has happened in the past two years, have consolidated a duality in Hong Kong's legal system. Uh, to borrow again from Ernst Frankel's um, co concept of the dual state, we now have a normative domain in which the full panoply of rights in Hong Kong's liberal common law tradition applies, existing in parallel with a prerogative domain in which diluted versions of those guarantees apply, or even none at all if the case was transferred to the jurisdiction of the party controlled courts in Beijing. Uh, the Chinese government, by virtue of it having the final power of interpreting the NSL and the basic law, has absolute power to decide which domain a matter falls into. Everything is potentially political. In the run of the mill cases, ordinary liberal principles apply, but in matters deemed sensitive by Beijing, and as emphasized by um, Johannes and other commentators, sensitive matters are not limited to NSL matters. Um, it could be other public law or, or just sensitive, deemed by Beijing. Um, when those matters are involved, the special regime applies. The normative domain is a pocket of regularity within the prerogative state, which is a sea of arbitrariness. And I'm going to end um, this commentary by probing what the normative domain in Hong Kong comprises. Writing in the context of the Nazi regime, Frankel explains that the normative domain in the legal system of the Third Reich comprises the laws and institutions carried forward from the more liberal Weimar era. Although such remnants of the Reichstag, um, to borrow from Maya Henrich's term, remnants of the Reichstag, Although these remnants are unlikely to be able to fully liberate the legal system, and obviously from history, we know that such remnants failed to stop the Nazi regime from becoming a totalitarian government. Um, such remnants are nonetheless able to reduce the reach of the prerogative domain and mitigate um, the effects of the prerogative domain on the normative domain. Um, in, in Xiaobo's words, um, tame the prerogative um, domain. The remnants of the previous more liberal era in Hong Kong comprise at least the following, I think, at least the following. Um, uh, first, institutions such as courts and administrative bureaucracy 
which now function as agents of both the normative and prerogative domains. Uh, in other words, we, we need to bear in mind that the institutions of the two halves of the dual state overlap. So it's the same court that we're talking about that, that, that has delivered these really liberal LGBT rights judgments. It's the same court that is delivering these judgments and the NSO judgments that, that, that compromise procedural rights. Um, so, so that's that's the first thing which I think is the remnant, the the institutions from from the previous more liberal era. The second remnant is um, that we have a readily available body of principles from the common law that the courts can draw upon to protect rights. And the third remnant is, uh, which I think is the most important one, is an entrenched rule of law consciousness amongst the Hong Kong judiciary and legal profession. So, unlike their counterparts in mainland China or, or some other authoritarian states, which see the value of legality as purely instrumental. I think there is really an entrenched rule of law consciousness and the judiciary and the legal profession see the inherent value of legality and they ab ab abide by legality um, out of a sense of habit, but also uh, a sense of professional identity. As a result of these remnants, I think, um, it's likely that where the political stakes are sufficiently low, the courts would apply liberal principles with full rigor, including reading down decisions from Beijing. It also means that there's a very low risk of courts allowing anti-rights proxies developed in politically sensitive cases to taint non-sensitive cases. So the possibility that I highlighted earlier on of the prerogative state hollowing out the, the, the common law is a, is a probably won't occur. And compared to the mainland Chinese legal system, which itself is also emerging as a dual state, um, but which unfortunately is not endowed with those remnants from a previous more liberal era, the normative pockets in Hong Kong's legal system are likely to be bigger and more sustainable. I think Hualing has written elsewhere um, that says that while the, the, the mainland Chinese system is emerging as a dual state, but they don't have these remnants from a previous era because they're starting from a state of lawlessness. And I think Hong Kong is a lot more well endowed in that respect. We're, we're going into, we're converging with the mainland China, Chinese legal system in terms of becoming a dual state, but we have these, we, we were able to inherit these, these remnants from the previous more um, liberal era. Um, so while we um, lament that a duality has emerged in our legal system, we should perhaps be relieved that there is still a duality and that we're not experiencing full-blown non-bifurcated authoritarianism. Um, in other words, there is still room for legal contestation, although I agree with Johannes that in practice, the courts have not been using fully um, the room that is given to them. Um, for those who care about maintaining the rule of law in Hong Kong, then, Perhaps realistically, the goal should no longer be to liberate the entire legal order, but to preserve as far as politically possible and expand whenever politically possible the normative domain. Um, so congratulations again um, on this collection um, and, and thank you very much for, for these very in inspiring papers.